Hallelujah. I believe what Shepherd John said is if you, if you don't get anything it, out of what's happened here today, you need to understand how important this particular book of Exodus is because it is the defining map for where we are on Abba's calendar and where we're headed. So many of our friends that are still in the Christian church and a lot of others out there discount what's written in the Torah. And by doing so, you're traveling blind. Amen? Amen. Give Abba a praise. This is exciting. And looking at this particular Torah portion, Vayera, uh, we've taught on this for more than 20 years. And there's some things in this Torah portion. Every, I don't care who you are. If you are intent on hearing from Abba and your heart is right and you sit down before him, He's going to show you things in his word regarding where you are currently in your relationship with him and the current timetable, I believe, that he has for you as an individual and corporately as a believing community. And this Torah portion is no different. I believe with everything in me that they are living shadow pictures of where we are right now, and yet they're speaking to our future. And as I was looking at this particular Torah portion, there's some things that I felt like Abba was revealing that I have not seen before. And I, I want to just challenge you to, I want to challenge you to lay aside your preconceived uh, notions, the particular paradigm you may have had regarding your, uh, some of your religious ideals, and just consider what I'm going to share with you this afternoon, because you're going to hear some things that, uh, quite frankly, I believe you probably have never heard before. And in doing so, I want to admonish you to measure them against his scripture, his word. Uh, we're told on more than a, one occasion, let everything be established in the mouth of at least two witnesses. I'm going to give you a preponderance of witnesses, an overwhelming amount of witnesses this afternoon, and I'm going to uh, do everything I can to come to a conclusion and show you what I believe I'm seeing in this uh, Torah portion, but you have to do what 2 Timothy 2.15 says, and that's to study for your yourself. Study to show yourself approved unto Yahweh, Workmen that need not to be ashamed, and the only way you can do that is by rightly dividing this word of truth. And this particular Torah portion, Vayera, starts in Exodus chapter 6, verse 2, and runs through chapter 9, verse 35, and it will cover quite a preponderance of different powerful revelatory things, uh, dealing in particular with the plagues, and I'm telling you, we're already seeing the plague, and it's my opinion that we're probably in the third or fourth plague if you will, based on the illustrations that I've seen in the book of Exodus, and it's only going to intensify. And I want to remind you, the wrath of the enemy is being poured out. We don't have to fear that if we're in proper relationship with Yahweh. If you're not in proper relationship with Him, then you need to fear the wrath of Yahweh, which follows shortly on the heels of that. Amen? What I want to look at here is the title of Vayera, and we were, going, we're going to examine it probably from some different vantage points than you have in the past. It's usually translated as, and I appeared. And it's Abba speaking in the first person. And he's talking about how he has appeared in the past. And quite honestly, when you start looking at this, uh, the way that uh, things are about to unfold in this Torah portion, you can get caught up in what I have in my notes uh, called a corn maze of tradition. On the surface, the text makes it apparent, as Abba speaking to Moshe, that there is a specific name by which he had been known previously to the patriarchs, the patriarchs being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that name was none other than El Shaddai. However, he's telling us here that the designation or the name Yahweh, which he is now sharing, that they did not know him by. And if you've studied the Scripture, and beginning all the way back in the second chapter of the book of Genesis, you know that there are a myriad of texts where the name yod heh vav -Hey, the Tetragrammaton, has actually been revealed and known long before we get to where we are in this Parsha. And so when you see that, it's almost as if there's a contradiction in this particular Torah portion. And if you don't stop when you see those kinds of things and then go back and begin to examine them to find out exactly what's being shown us, you're going to miss what Abba's trying to reveal. And I'm telling you, 
This message regarding who El Shaddai is and who yod heh is is extremely important to us right now, and even more so as the events on the horizon begin to reveal themselves. It seems as if that there are two titles of two separate and distinct gods, if you will, as some suppose. And also there are some that believe that these two different uh, distinct identities are revealing two different aspects or different parts of the character and nature of Elohim. And so I want to look at each one of those. First of all, we're going to look at El Shaddai. Normally or usually you find it uh, uh, being defined as the all-sufficient one. It actually speaks, in my opinion, of the omniscient one's power over creation, while it also appears, if you go back and look at where it's used and how it's used and the context in which it's used, it's actually appearing as if this name signifies what this entity has done in the past and is currently doing right now. And it's also inferring that he can, by virtue of the character embodied in El Shaddai, that he can do all things. And yet it's different from the name yod heh vav in though in that El Shaddai declares he is capable, but there's no guarantee necessary at the present for him to demonstrate his capabilities until such time as Israel as a people need him to, re- to respond as their deliverer. Does that make sense to you? Hopefully it will as we continue. Now, if we look next at the title yod heh vav or the name yod heh vav it's probably there more often in the text than any other name, if you will. And it's normally translated with the all caps that you see in the King James English as L-O-R-D. And you can see it literally expounded upon. It's almost as if in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when Moshe is being introduced to this specific entity, yod heh vav and he's asking, whom will I tell the children of Israel has sent me? It's almost as if he begins to pull back he here, being this entity, this being, yod heh vav He sort of pulls back the cover, and he's, he expounds on who yod heh vav is, because he says in the Hebrew, Eshyeh, Asher, Eshyeh. I am who I am. Now, this name differs from El Shaddai in that, I am, or yod heh vav actually focuses on a future prophetic dimensional aspect of the creature, the creator, excuse me. And what it's actually inferring is that when you see yod heh vav he's beginning to reveal his purpose and his plan in creation regarding his redemption and salvific message, and it's always speaking prophetic into the future, okay? So when you see yod heh vav used, His name actually is expressing an immediacy. In other words, a tangible presence that is now moving, and he is going to continue to move on behalf of the individual who has invoked this name. Now, El Shaddai is telling you that he is capable of doing whatever is necessary to to redeem you, to save you, but until such time as you invoke that name, he's, he's there on the sidelines. yod heh vav heh appears because someone had the backbone to use that name and invoke them in, him into their circumstances. Okay? In fact, there's a phrase, Yahweh, my deliverer. And if you look at that, that phrase in the Hebrew language, it has a numeric value of 195 which happens to be the same as the Hebrew phrase or Hebrew word miknah, which means a purchase, a possession, the price of something, or the deed of purchase, a redemption price. So inherent in the phrase, Yahweh my deliverer, and it's actually indicating that you're calling on him now because you need him. He is my deliverer. When? When I need him, and I need him now. And so he becomes the redemption price for me in the midst of whatever circumstance I may need him at that particular moment. Does that make sense? Now, you may still be confused. And if you are, then what we need to do is go back again and remind you, yes, indeed, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob each knew the name yod heh vav So what exactly are we being shown? In order to 
find out what Abba's trying to reveal, us, to reveal to us, we need to go back and set kind of a, a stage, if you will, or a platform. First of all, at the time this Parsha is being looked at, for generations Israel has been in captivity. Israel is fully aware of the prophecy to Abraham regarding the length or the tenure, the duration of their bondage. In fact, if you go back and, and look at it in Exodus chapter 12, verse 40, it tells us that they were there 430 years in bondage and that they left on the exact day that the end of that bondage occurs. And so Israel is well aware of it. Are you with me? Now, there are a lot of arguments that, that are abound, and, and people use that as points of division, and they say that there's some confusion in the text because some say 430 years in captivity, and in Genesis chapter 15, 13, we're told 400 years. It's my opinion that it's the King James English text and the intent of those who were translating to bring the confusion that keeps you from understanding Yahweh has a time clock and he is never early. Oh, excuse me. He is never late. Maybe that would have helped you if I'd have said that soon. Are you with me? And so what happens is that as you begin to put this in its proper context, it will help you. Let's look a little bit further. I want to re read to you uh, what we were just talking to you about in Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. Now, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. How many of you have ever read this before? Well, on the face value of that, it looked as if they spent 430 years total in bondage in the land of Egypt. But that's not what it's actually saying. If you look at the phrase there, who dwelt in Egypt, it's actually a parenthetical statement that's actually related to the children of Israel, not the sojourning. It's telling you that they are currently, as this is being expressed, they are currently dwelling in Egypt. Are you with me? And so the emphasis is on where they are at the moment, making the entire length of their sojourning or journey a total of 430 years whereas the majority of the latter half has been spent dwelling in Egypt, okay? And it's simply because we read these things and there's a misunderstanding that surround, surrounds them and we don't take the time to go back and look at it. And so it seems as if there's a contradictory, contradictory date setting that's taking place. But what you need to understand is that the truth is there and the truth can be excavated if you're willing to do so and the truth will be central into helping you to understand what's happening right now because in this Parsha, Vayera, their deliverance is beginning, okay? So what was it, 430 or 400 in years? Both of them are right. Neither of them are wrong. It just depends on the context that you use it in, okay? And so once again, our title, Vayera, and I appeared, it gives you a point to begin with because Yahweh himself is referencing his appearances. Notice that's in the plural. He's referencing here, and I appeared. It has a past connotation. He's referencing that he has appeared before to those patriarchs that we just mentioned. And so you need to go back and understand the law of first reference gives you some context. The first time that you find him appearing to one of the patriarchs is when he appears to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. And it's interesting because when he appears, he's beginning to express a covenant promise uh, to Abraham with the name yod heh vav -He, central in that covenanting. And it's interesting because every time you see a covenant-cutting process or the reiteration of a covenant-cutting, it will always be in conjunction with the appearance of this yod heh vav -He. Okay? Now, the first time you see it, Genesis 15, verse 18, is in the place that I like to call the covenant of the uh, the covenant between the pieces. I know you understand Abraham uh, is told to, to take an animal and cut it in half, and then there's someone going to walk between the pieces, right? It's interesting because this seems as if it's a peculiar ritual because this is the only time that they're told that anyone's told <clears throat> to take a sacrifice and cut it in half. And so you need to go back and look what's going on here because this is very pertinent to the legacy of Israel as we begin to read this. Now, for some extra clarity, 
even though there's people that, that like to argue about what's transpiring and what I'm about to show you, you need to go back and look at some of the extra biblical works in my opinion. Not to the exclusion of the Torah, but just add some emphasis and clarity. For instance, the book of Jubilees points to the location of this particular event called the covenant between the pieces. And the, it actually occurred at what the location was known as the Oak of Mamre. And we've taught on this before. Abraham, uh, after he is circumcised, he sits underneath this same oak at the same location where the three emissaries, and I believe one of those was yod heh vav -Heh, comes to announce the birth of Isaac and also to tell him what's going to happen with Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's also my opinion that this covenant of the pieces actually transpires right here in the same location where that other event took place. And I'm convinced that this would have been probably the location of Eden proper, the Garden of Eden. Are you with me? And the reason I'm saying this is because what transpires here with the covenant of the pieces, the covenant of walking between the pieces, and what took place when Abraham is visited by the three angelic hosts, if you'll allow that, all of it parallels what originally occurred back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. And so if you can understand that and see the connection, it adds some weight to what we're trying to establish. How? It's my opinion that here at the Oak of Mamre, Abraham and Sarah, remember Sarah's in a tent. She hears the, the message from these angelic visitors, and she laughs. Remember the story? It's my opinion that Abraham and Sarah are called upon to fulfill the same identical role of Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, the way that they were called originally back in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3, to bring forth, to become a vehicle or a vessel, if you will, that would bring forth the promised seed. And in the process of being called upon to bring forth the promised seed, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, Abraham and Sarah are given title deed to the land. Now, it's interesting. Go back and study the events of Genesis chapter 3. You know the fall, the encounter there with the, the Nakash at the tree. And death enters into the world. There is the need for a redemptive act to occur. And it's my opinion that Genesis chapter 3 reveals a covenant occurring similar to this covenant of the pieces that we're talking about in Genesis chapter 15. And furthermore, it proves to us that neither Adam nor Abraham had the ability to walk between the pieces because they were not qualified to be mediators of the covenant that is being revealed by these events. Does that make sense? And so, as a result, you find in Genesis chapter 3, the appearance of the quote-unquote voice walking in the garden, just like you find in Genesis chapter 15, there is the appearance of one who will walk between the pieces on behalf of Abraham. You see that? In each one of those instances, this is what I like to refer to as the manifest presence, the, the made visible physical presence of the Creator that comes down and gets involved in a covenant-cutting process to reveal through these typological events His future salvific and redemption plan, not only for the house of Israel, but for mankind as a whole. Does you see that? And so when you start looking at this, then... It gives you an idea of the identity of not only this manifest presence, who do you think possibly this entity could be? And if you look at the fact that he is called yod heh vav -Heh, pro probably you've had some preconceived ideas in the past about who this yod heh vav -Heh is. And so I believe we need to stop and just consider some of these things and maybe revisit it. Now, let me qualify that. It's my opinion that the role of yod heh vav -Heh throughout the entirety of the Scripture is consistent. He never varies. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Behold, I am yod heh vav -Heh, I change not. Okay? Now, you may hear me interchangeably using yod heh vav -Heh, Yahweh. Please don't get offended. There are a lot of people that I love dearly that, that use that pronounce that a different way, but you should know who I'm talking about, okay? 
This entity functions as the soul. He alone. He is the soul deliverer and redeemer of Israel. In every instance, when you see the manifest presence appearing to deliver Israel, just like in this Torah portion, Vadiera, when he's saying, look, I am going to identify myself now as yod Hey vav Why? Because he's about to deliver his people, okay? And let me just emphasize, no animal sacrifice, no amount of good works, and neither could any descendant of Adam ever sac- be good enough, if you'll allow, to repair the severed relationship between Elohim and the fallen Adam, except and unless he manifested himself in a form in the earth to become revealed as the Messiah figure who would redeem not only the house of Israel, but mankind as a whole. No other vessel, no other vehicle, no animal sacrifice, nothing else would work to redeem fallen mankind except this entity who steps in on the scene and reveals himself as yod heh vav Now, oh, wait just a second. That's all the Old Testament, okay? You, you hold on to that opinion for a little while. I will suggest this to you. To reject yod heh vav then and now, and when you find out in, at the conclusion of what I'm sharing who this person yod Hey vav Hey is, it may rub your fur backwards. But to reject yod Hey vav Hey is to reject salvation, redemption, and deliverance that are provided in who he is. Amen? 400 years. Let's look at this. The curse of generations. Man, this blessed me when I was listening to Brenda talking just a, a couple of weeks ago about this whole idea. This is just mind staggering. If you read Genesis chapter 3, we were just talking about a first example of a cutting of a covenant when someone had to walk between the pieces. Adam is dead. Eve is dead. No, they can't. There's nothing they can do to redeem themselves. And so the voice, yod heh vav has to appear on the scene. Okay. And from that time forward, even to the day that you and I are living in and into our future, all succeeding generations in, of Adam and Chava are cursed. In the same vein, Abraham and Sarah, uh, Sarah were patterned after that very event. And so what was it that supposedly happened that leaded up to the generations of Abraham and Sarah being cursed and sent into bondage for 400 years? Go back and read Genesis chapter 15. It tells Abraham that his family is going to go into bondage for a certain length of time, but it never tells us why in the text. And so you have to go back and do, again, do some excavation on your own. And is it possible, as Brenda was alluding to, that the events regarding how the Egyptian, Egyptian princess Hagar was treated by Sarah, go back January 7th of this year, and you'll find that teaching of Brenda's, and the subsequent inaction of Abraham, is it possible that that's what happened that could have led to the fulfillment of Exodus chapter 34, verse 7? And I'm going to read that to you in a minute. And the cursing of the seed sending them into bondage in Egypt. You have to ask these questions. Why did they go into bondage for 430 years? Well, here in Exodus chapter 34, it tells you. We just got through looking at one of the songs regarding this. This is Abba speaking, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Now, let me just declare this. A biblical generation is most often counted as 100 years. 400 years would be four generations. And is it possible that the actions of Abraham and Sarah is what set in motion this season of bondage for the children of Israel to go down into Egypt unto the fourth generation? Well, in my opinion, it's crucial for us to understand that if we're going to grasp why the writer in Exodus 12, 41 makes it plain that Israel knew the very exact day their bondage was to end. In fact, it says that. 
Even the self-same day it came to pass. To add emphasis to that, most of us believe in what we commonly refer to as a greater exodus. Am I right? And if that's the case, that it's interesting because the timing of this greater exodus that we're all expecting, and, and please, if you have a different opinion, type it in the, the context section. Get in touch with us verse, uh, you know, via email or whatever. But let your opinion be an educated and informed opinion. Don't just argue for the sake of argument, all right? It's my opinion that if we're expecting a greater exodus, we should know even the self-same day that it should come to pass. It should not be shrouded in secrecy, and it should not be hidden from us, and we should not be ignorant of it. Am I right? To be hidden in secrecy is not consistent with any of the previous appearings via of Yahweh, because if you go back and study it, on every occasion it was prophesied that this was going to happen it was known about and so his agenda or his itinerary has been written in the stellar luminaries for millennia so how can we know today when to expect him and who will this him be when's his vayera are y'all getting any is this helping you any now if we continue to unravel the backstory it seems that the covenant of pieces begins the time frame for the 430-year countdown. That's what Yahweh said. Your children are going to go into bondage for 400 years. But when you start looking at that, you have some that say 400 and 430. Most scholars agree that at the time that Abraham was about to offer up Isaac, that he would have been not a, a young pup, 13 to 15 years old, but more than likely at least 30 years old at the timing of Genesis chapter 22, where he is, quote-unquote, offered up as a sacrifice. That would have occurred some 30 years after Genesis chapter 15, walking between the covenant of the pieces. So from Genesis 15 forward, you have 430 years. From Genesis chapter 22, you have 400 years. Does that make sense? There's a 30 year difference in the time frame. And so you find that as Isaac is being offered up, he is fulfilling the prophetic role as the Messiah, the promised seed, in the same fashion that Yeshua would when he would begin his ministry during his 30th year. And so again, you have consistency in the numbers, all right? It's this promised seed that would become the Savior, Redeemer and deliverer of the house of Israel. No one questions this. I don't care if you're Jew or Gentile, Christian or what. Everybody acknowledges that the prophetic intent of that phrase, promised seed, identified a future Savior, Redeemer, and deliverer of Israel. Nobody questions that. In fact, no one that I know of denies that all of the candidates out of the loins of Adam were also disqualified. No man could suffice as the redeemer of the fallen Adam. You have some that will argue that animal sacrifices would, and that is not the case. All the animal sacrifice did was to put off the judgment until one who would arrive on the scene and manifest presence, the appearing of the Creator in the earth, and it's his death, burial, and resurrection alone that could offset the penalty, okay? Now, it seems to me then that we need to be expecting another future divine appearance, a vayera, a another future I am who I am encounter where the presence of Elohim is going to be somehow physically introduced in the physical realm. That's the only remedy. And we saw that initially, at least we believe this, we saw that initially in the coming of our Messiah, Yeshua. Am I right? Well, if the pattern continues, then we should also expect in the days ahead when we're about to be delivered and set free, come out of bondage, then we also need to expect a divine appearance into the physical realm of another individual who could be called the manifest presence of the Most High. 
It is a consistent promise that has been prophetically rehearsed in every, go back, I challenge you, go back and look at this yourself. In every instance where you see the term yod heh vav heh used or interjected, it's always with where there is a covenanting, covenanting process being initiated or a reaffirmation of the same. And so we need to go back and look at these rehearsals because if they're consistent, we should expect the same in the days ahead. Amen? Now, the writers of the text, and you'll see some that differ. Some recite 430, some 400. They weren't confused, and they're not con contradicting one another. See, people take these little sound bites out to try and tell you that the Scriptures are inconsistent, and I submit to you that if the Hebrew was inconsistent, then we're in trouble. Say amen. All they did was simply reference some different points in the timeline. And I want to emphasize to you this afternoon that it is a calculated and precise timeline. What's more, when you go back and look at the covenant of pieces where Abraham is shown falling into a deep sleep, you find he's not able to personally cut the covenant. Go back and read Genesis 15. And the why of his not being able to cut the covenant is hidden. I submit to you that it's hidden in the last thing that Abraham does before he falls asleep. See, we need to know why Abraham, you've read this probably all the, your life. Why wasn't Abraham able to cut a covenant? Well, we're going to look at that. Because he's found the last act he does before falling asleep is where he's found driving away the fowls that came down upon the pieces. Now, the King James English makes what's about to happen, what I'm about to reveal to you in this next uh, couple of verses, they make it almost irrelevant and immaterial to what we're talking about. And I want to read it to you, and then when we read it and you look at it, you just decide if it's irrelevant or not. Let's look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 11. Are you ready? And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now, I want to read this to you and take out a couple of isolated words in the Hebrew language. Let's look specifically at who these fowls are. If you look in, in the Hebrew, Strong's number 5861, it's rendered eat and translated as a bird of prey, as in a vulture or a buzzard or something of that sort. But it comes from the root word that means to scream or to shriek. How many of you know or have ever seen buzzards gather when there's a lot of screaming and shrieking going on? I don't. So I thought, hmm, that's odd. The root stem, the I and tit, gives us the Hebrew word for a stylus, a writing instrument like a pen. And it's used metaphorically to indicate sin. It's also seen in Several words that mean counsel, discretion, to wrap or to cover, to hide something. And it's also similar to accusations that are written and read in a court of law. When I saw that, it reminded me instantly of the handwriting of ordinances that would be against you and I and that were nailed to the tree by our Messiah Yeshua. Am I right? Let's look at the word carcass. These files came down upon the carcass. That word is pagar. Of course, it's translated as a corpse or a carcass, but it can indicate a monument, listen to this, or an idolatrous image. It comes from the root pagar, which means to be exhausted or faint, and that root is seen in such words as paga, which means to meet or to encounter. And if you remember, when Jacob has the dream of the latter, he encounters at this place called Beit El, the house of Yahweh, he encounters the manifest presence of yod heh vav -Heh, ascending and descending upon the ladder, Genesis 28, 11, and he references the same Yeshua does in John 1, 51. When he's calling out his disciples, he says, oh, if you're marveling about what I said to Nathaniel underneath that tree, hereafter you'll see the angels of Elohim ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So there's a, another cross-reference uniting the two. 
okay? Now, it's interesting to look at the pay gemel root of this Hebrew word pagah because that's the same root of the Hebrew word, one of the Hebrew words for fig. And if you notice, immediately that word fig should kind of raise a red flag because that again points to Yeshua because Yeshua curses a fig tree just prior to his execution. Is there a connection here? Well, let me just stop long enough and take a sort of a side journey and show you what's happening with this fig tree. The Hebrew word for uh, fig, pe gimel, is important. If you remember the gospel accounts, when Yeshua is cursing this fig tree, he's returning from Bethany. Okay? And if you go back and look at the chronology, this has taken place over a two-day period. And all you have to do is go back and look in a couple of the gospel examples, and you find in Luke 13 that prior to making this trip, he had just had a long discourse with the Pharisees and the groups that were around him at that particular time, and he was admonishing them, and he called and compared that generation to an unproductive fig tree that was planted in a vineyard. Hmm. To supplement that, go back and read 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25, and Zechariah chapter 3, verse 10. And in both of those cases, when the advent of the Messianic age is about to occur, which is what Yeshua was doing, am I right? It was the advent of the Messianic age. These prophets in 1 Kings and in Zechariah tell us that at the advent of the Messianic age, everyone would sit under his own vine and his own fig tree. Why does that, what does that mean to us? I argue that anytime there is a future vieter or appearing, it would have to coincide with the emergence or the manifestation or the making visible, visible of yod heh vav in some form as the deliverer and redeemer of Israel this same yod hey vav hey that had been prior to this referred to by himself as ehye asher ehye. I am that I am. Are you with me? So, why did Yeshua curse this fig tree? Every, it looks as if it was an isolated event. He just got through comparing a generation to an unproductive fig tree. And so, a failure to produce figs would discount the appearance and dismiss our expectation of a coming Messiah and therefore diminish or do away with our need for deliverance and true repentance. That's why it's more than just cursing this isolated tree that had no figs on it. It's a figurative prophetic declaration regarding the house of Israel at that time who was an unproductive fig tree and because they were testifying against the coming of Messiah, they were attempting to disqualify him as Messiah and diminish then the need for deliverance and repentance. Wow. This took place over two days. Remember, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. It's been two days, 2,000 years since that generation embracing a fig tree of false temple religion was cursed. Therefore, in my opinion, this third temple, which in reality is actually going to be a reconstructed Roman, former Roman garrison, it is also an unproductive fig tree, and it does not enhance what the Hebrew roots community believe or what the Christian community believes. In fact, it diminishes the expectation of Yeshua as our Messiah, because if, in fact, our Messiah Yeshua does appear on the scene, it is said by even some of my Hebrew roots brothers that he has to conform to Talmudic dogma and has to submit to the Levitical order before he is accepted. I'm declaring he's the king of creation, the Melchizedek high priest, and will submit to no one. Let's look at this name, Bethany, the place that he had just left. It's usually rendered as house of affliction or house of misery. 
But all you have to do is go back and do a little research on your own. You'll find the ayin noon hey root also can indicate to answer, to respond, to reply, or to testify. It carries the idea legally of one who is called on to be a witness. And when he curses this fig tree, he's actually referring to a generation, a rebellious generation represented by an unproductive fig tree, that they're declaring that he is a false and counterfeit witness. And so they are testifying against Yeshua. That unproductive fig tree testified against his role as the Messiah in the earth. And thus, that generation rejected redemption and salvation. I'm telling you, the same generations today that are proposing a third temple are claiming, many of them are claiming to be Jews, but according to what we're told in the book of Revelation, Many of them are out of the synagogue of Satan. Not all. They have been infiltrated, and it's the infiltrators that are going to be koshered from the land. I'm telling you, unless you get an undeniable word from Yahweh to visit the land, you better not go because the land is going to be koshered. It's just a matter of time, and one day, People will be over there when the koshering process starts. <coughs> Are you hearing me? Let's go back and look at this covenant of the pieces. We were talking about the fowls descending on those carcasses. Is it possible that instead of, listen to me now, this is going to require you to think outside the box. Is it possible that rather than actual birds of prey, based on what we saw in the Hebrew text, that these Entities that were supposedly feeding on the animal carcasses were in fact demonic or fallen angelic beings that were there sent to bring railing accusations against Abraham and citing Abraham's sin and his disqualification as mediator. The handwriting of ordinances against Abraham. Abraham was not qualified and so Abraham could not walk between the pieces. And so is it possible that there is such an overwhelming spiritual encounter that it brings Abraham physically to the point of death, whereupon a divine being, a yod he vav he the manifest presence in the person of a smoking furnace and a burning lamp, has to pass in his stead between the pieces, becoming the deliverer of the house of Israel who's in the loins of Abraham. You see that? This is a, go back and look for yourself. This is, a, this is another instance of divine intervention. And if the Torah, the scriptures are consistent, it has to be the same being who's identified as yod He vav He, and it epitomizes what's being said in this Torah portion, Vayera, and I appeared. See, this was just not an isolated one-time event that he appears to Moshe. He appeared at the burning bush. He has appeared from Genesis. Go back and look. He's not mentioned in Genesis chapter 1 in the initial creation. He is mentioned in Genesis chapter 2 where he gets it down hands on and begins to form the body of the man. Are you listening to me? Well, what does this have to do with our discussion? I believe it's very important because we need to be able to distinguish between who El Shaddai is in this Parsha, Vayera, and who yod heh vav -He is. And in fact, you have to be able to ask the question, if we are indeed expecting a future greater exodus, then shouldn't we also be expecting yod heh vav -He, the manifest presence, as ye, asher, as ye, I am who I am, listen to this, You've never thought about, I promise you, you've not thought about this, what I'm about to tell you. I am who I am, that's past, present, but I also am who I will be. Do you hear that? The I am is telling you who he is going to be. He's giving you a clue of who he's going to be and when to expect him. And listen to me. He is going to arrive in a timely fashion, 
at the end of our bondage just as he did here in this Torah portion. Go back and look. The patterns are consistent. For the sake of time, skip this particular. I want to, that particular slide. I'm going to look. Y'all go back and get these notes. I'm trying to get through it as soon as I can. The greater Exodus and a final Vieira. And I appeared. As with every previous, listen to me, this is powerful. In every previous appearance, when yod heh vav -Hey appears, there was also, on record, an individual who would serve as a spokesperson on behalf of this one who's being manifested as divine. Am I right? In other words, you had Abraham. You had Adam and Eve there. You have Abraham. You have Isaac. You have Jacob. You have Joseph. In this particular portion, you have Moshe. And so what we're doing, we're actually attempting to identify who the one is that's appearing, this yod heh vav -Hey. But the agent that represents him in the future, in my opinion, is no less a mystery than who this yod heh vav -Hey is. Am I right? So every time he appears, you can expect an ambassador to be there to be a spokesperson on his behalf, right? And so what we need to do is to determine who one of the other is because if you can determine who one of the other is, it will help you to identify the, the other one. Am I correct? Well, first of all, I want to argue that most Christians, most Hebrew roots, most Messianics, and all the Jewish believers that I know expect Judah to be in the lead role as the agent of yod heh vav -Hey in the days in front of us. They deny Yeshua. Okay? And so they're expecting themselves to be the agent on behalf of yod heh vav -Hey. I submit that by identifying Judah's role, you'll also be able to identify who they are an agent of, if in fact they are. I personally believe that there are counterfeit Edomites in deeply embedded in the house of Israel, masquerading, Esau masquerading as Jacob as we speak, and they are working feverishly to make this a self-fulfilling prophecy and in addition to that, they're attempting to restore a Levitical order who themselves are also counterfeit. As a result, the push to build a third temple is a disguise that when exposed is going to reveal that they are not an emissary of yod heh vav -Hey, but they're going to be an agent of the man of sin. So who is the genuine one? Those that are espousing the rebuilding of the third temple, are claiming it as the house of Yahweh. But out of the other side of their mouth, they emphatically deny the role as, of Yeshua as our Messiah, and he would not be welcome, neither would his followers be welcome if it was finished completion tomorrow. He nor you would not be welcomed in. So can I have Yahweh without Yeshua? To provide you an answer regarding who this is, and you can see it throughout the prophetic symbolism, I'm convinced that the Torah portion by Yerda reveals the identity of this current agent, the one who is going to be the agent representing him. And if I can identify the agent who's going to represent yod heh vav -Hey, I believe that it will also at the same time point you a finger to who yod heh vav -Hey is. And I know what you're thinking. I already know who yod heh vav -Hey is. God the Father. Okay. Hmm. I can hear your mind. I can hear them grinding, them wheels grinding. In order to understand what I'm trying to establish, you need to go back and look at the entrance of Moshe on the scene here in our Torah portion. Okay. What happens? You find Israel in Egypt amidst great persecution. Am I right? And this persecution has arisen because. A new Pharaoh now sits on the throne, okay? Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, and Brenda touched on this and just blew my mind. And some of y'all have never, how many of you have ever had your mind blown? You're afraid to raise your hand, ain't you? Yeah, some of you, it's like trying to blow the fuzz off a peach. When you sit down and Abba begins to show you some of the stuff like, this is mind staggering. 
Exodus 1 verse 8. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Now Brenda talked about this a couple of weeks ago. The Egyptians knew Joseph, but not as Joseph. His name had been changed to Zaphnathpaneah. Genesis 1, uh, 41 verse 45. And when I was looking at this, I thought, man, this is powerful. I want you to stop here for a second. I want you to think about something. Pharaoh is considered the supreme deity of Egypt, okay? And when he names Joseph, y'all know this. Do I need to go into the story of Joseph? Y'all know what happens, right? Pharaoh is the supreme deity of Egypt. He is the Elohim. And then he makes a statement. Genesis 41, 40, when he calls him Zophnoth Paneah, he says, as a result, you shall be over my house. Wait a second. Elohim has someone who's going to be over his house. And all my people will be ruled according to your word. Does that mean Zophnoth Paneah was the living word of Pharaoh? Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Do you hear what was just said? Pharaoh knew more about the creator of the universe and the divine hierarchy demonstrated in the prophetic role of who Joseph originally was than 99% of believers today. Pharaoh is acting as Elohim and he's acknowledging Zophnoth Paneach as the Messiah figure. And he specifically points out the power that is going to be inherent in the word of Zophnoth Paneah. All the people will be ruled by your word. Say amen right there. Now we need to look at who this Zophnoth Paneah is. If you go back and look at your Strong's Concordance, it's going to have it as translated as a treasurer of the glorious wrist. And most of you will go there and look at that and say, wow, that's good enough. I'll just keep it. And then it says, well, it could be the revealer of secrets. Well, yes, he was an interpreter of dreams. But Zophnach Paneah is not Hebrew. It's Egyptian. So now I need to go back and ask myself, what was the Egyptian definition of Zophnach Paneah? And it means, this blew my mind, Savior of the world. Elohim just identified the Savior of the world. Did you hear that? And that's appropriate because Joseph was and is a shadow picture of Yeshua, Yehoseph. He would become Mashiach ben Yosef. But it's interesting because our text tells us that this new king in our Torah portion, Vayera, didn't know Joseph, but it's evident that he knew Zophnach Paneah. So what's going on here? Have y'all ever just stopped and asked these kind of questions? Sometimes I get them, I get myself in a train wreck, and it's hard to just, I have to hold on to sit in my, in my chair. Let me tell you what the Zothnoth Paneah, from, from Pharaoh's perspective, he doesn't know Joseph, and so he will not understand the Hebrew rendering of what Joseph means and how it apply, applies here. But he knows Zophnoth Paneach, this new Pharaoh now. And we've got a new Pharaoh coming that does not know Joseph, but he knows Zophnoth Paneach, okay? And Pharaoh knew Zophnoth Paneach was dead. And since Zophnoth Paneach was dead, there's no need to fear him or be concerned with one who has succumbed to death. In fact, the death of Zophnoth Paneah called into question the promise of the firstborn that had been given to Abraham and the subsequent redemption of all Israel that Abraham had built his faith on. And so he's poo-pooing everything Abraham and the house of Israel been living for. Your Redeemer, Zophnach Paneach, the Savior of the world, he's dead. He failed to resurrect. Now you know why they had a stone put in front of the tomb of our Messiah for three days. Why? They were expecting him to be a Zophnach Paneach. Savior of the world would not resurrect. Are you hearing me? However, there was a well-kept secret. He didn't know Joseph, so he didn't understand this secret. 
if he had understood this secret, things would have been different regarding how they handled Israel in the land. Are you with me? And if you go back and look at 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 8, it tells us the same thing regarding Yeshua, Mashiach ben Yosef, when he came the first time. It says, now the rulers of the world understood it because if they had, excuse me, none of the rulers of the world understood it because if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, you look at that word Lord, it's just callously thrown throughout the New Testament all caps, and we accept it, and don't go back and look at it. In the Greek Septuagint, it's the word krios, and it's most often used, and you, when I say Septuagint, the Septuagint is a translation of all the text from Genesis to Revelation. Are you with me? A Greek translation. That word krios is the word that is most often used for yod he vav he. So they're talking about crucifying yod he vav he of glory. Are you hearing me? And so somehow this yod he vav he is connected to the redemption plan that is re revealed in a prophetic oracle that demonstrates sacrifice, resurrection, and deliverance. So why didn't Pharaoh know who Joseph was? The New Testament hides a powerful truth regarding not only who yod heh vav -He was, but also the connection to Yeshua. In fact, and I want to thank my brother, Yehulkanun Robinson, man, I'm telling you, he shared some stuff with me as I was trying to push this, put this together that you need to go back and look at. I need to get my notes. There are some intentional marker codes put there by the original translators who knew that if anything Hebraic was placed in there to identify yod He vav He and Yeshua to remotely connect them together, that it would have been destroyed, just like all of the Hebrew texts were attempted to. That's why it's hard to find anything in the New Testament that's considered Hebrew. Are you with me? Because they just tried to destroy it all. You follow me? But there are some marker codes, some hidden code letters and markings that were intentionally put in some of these ancient texts. And the purpose of that was to identify to the one who was in the know regarding who these people were. Are you, are you hearing me? Now, let's look at this Joseph because I assure you, the Pharaoh's coming who's not going to know the resurrected king known as Mashiach men yourself. And neither is he going to know the outcasts of Israel that are also known as yourself, the house of Joseph. Are you hearing me? Why didn't he know who Yosef was? It's usually translated as Yahweh will add, Yahweh will do again. He's going to repeat himself. In other words, He's there because he's going to, the name means he's going to give me another son. But it also hints at a redemptive process, including resurrection. And so it was the house of Joseph that would rise from the dead in Egypt, not Zophnoth Benea. What Pharaoh didn't know was that Joseph was the Savior, a typology of the Savior of the world, not this Egyptian rendering of him. Are you listening to me? And so it was the house of Joseph who would be resurrected and come out of the bondage of Egypt and Babylon. That's why in Revelation 18.4, we're told, come out of her. Why? We're going to follow the same pattern. We're going to have to. The house of Joseph is going to come out, be resurrected. For all intents and purposes, the lost tribes are considered dead. And I'm going to show you from a natural physical level as well, okay? Are y'all ready? I got 30 minutes. I don't know if I'm, I am halfway. I want to show you the parallel of Egypt's Zophnach Paneach. In fact, as we speak, that future parallel is going to identify the house of Joseph still in Babylon, and we are dead men. 
because we have engaged and contracted with Babylon, and listen, we have chosen to remain in Egypt, to remain in Babylon for all intents and purposes, we have failed to extricate ourselves from the clutches of the dead ones, and therefore we pose no threat to the Pharaoh of the current world's system. The powers that be right now are well aware of this, and just like Pharaoh and our Parsha, they're wondering not only who is the agent that's going to act on behalf of the supposed Redeemer of Israel, because they know the text, they know the prophecies, they know the time frames. And not only are they, wonder, are they wondering who is the agent of the Redeemer, and, but not only who the Redeemer is, and they're also wondering how can an exodus occur if, in fact, all of the known world have literally intentionally contracted themselves with the dead ones and remain dead men. Zaphnath Paneach is dead. Joseph, on the other hand, oh, Joseph, Kai, Joseph still lives, and they don't understand that. They don't understand that Joseph, the son who was dead, now lives. He was once lost at sea, and he's now found alive. He's being identified, and he's about to be redeemed, and he's about to access his inheritance. And I want to take you to Psalm 81, verse 5, and show you a unique prophecy in one word. In one word. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, Abba's word is powerful. This particular verse is actually speaking of our Torah portion right now. And this is speaking here of the Creator. It says, This He ordained in Joseph for a testimony when He went out through the land of Egypt, plaguing the land, are you with me? The plagues fell, where I heard a language that I understood not. Now, it's speaking of Yahweh's promise to deliver the house of Joseph, Israel in general, as He, Yahweh, plagues the land of Egypt. They heard a language, a language of freedom that they had, Hebrew, I might add, that they had not previously known. I want you to look at the way this name Joseph is written. The only time that the way that this name is styled throughout the, the Tanakh is seen. It has yod Hey vav samik Pei. It actually has prefixed in front of it the yod Hey of which is the abbreviated short form of Yehu or Yahu or Yahweh, and it's attached to the name Yosef. And so you literally have Yehoseph. And what's happening here is that it's identifying Joseph, and it's telling you that the revelation of who Joseph is is also hidden in the revelation of whom the being known as yod heh vav -Hey, the manifest presence, the one who appeared, he is. Most of, the world, right, most of the world will not argue. The outcasts of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, are commonly referred to as the house of Ephraim, Manasseh, or Joseph. And so Yeshua himself adds some emphasis to what I'm about to share with you in this statement. He says, I only came but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so it's, it seems to me that the remnant that's being gathered right now is, in fact, the house of Joseph. Raise your right hand, your index finger, and put it on your, your chest and say, I'm the house of Joseph. And if this is the case, I'm convinced that the house of Joseph, are you ready for this? The house of Joseph is the agents who, or agent who is going to represent the messianic deliverer known as yod Hey vav Hey at the very next Vieira that's on its way. And if that's true, just like in our Torah portion, there should be certain code words. Remember, I just told you that they heard words of freedom, certain code words. Well, the children of Israel heard those same code words. In fact, the rabbis say that there was a code phrase that Joseph had given to his children, and it was passed down all the way to Moshe, and Moshe used that code phrase so that the children of Israel would know he's the one, he's the agent, he's the one, okay? But is it also possible that in the days in front of us that there is going to be a, an intentional exposing, if you will, a pulling back of the covering so that the code words used by the house of Egypt or Babylon would also 
be exposed and revealed. Listen to me. If you go into one of today's courtroom and you don't know the language of the land, you're going to get in trouble. Listen to me. The entire known world is governed by their dead language. And the language of death is what has kept us suffering the sins of our fathers far longer than the third and fourth generation. The Mosaic Code phrase. That phrase was surely visit. Yahweh, listen to me. Wait a minute. There's it again. It tells you who's going to appear. Yahweh will surely visit the children of Israel. And that's in Exodus 3, verse 16. That phrase is pakad yifkad. And it is supposedly used throughout the generations from Joseph forward to identify who that deliverer was. And it's repeated in Exodus chapter 34, verse 7. We just read that to you. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin, that will no, by no means clear the guilty, visiting. This word visiting here is that code word, pecad. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Listen to me. You need to know that code phrase or else you're going to be still right there suffering from the guilt of the iniquity of your fathers and your forefathers. Are you listening to me? Most people assume that Picard specifically means to punish. Well, I want you to listen to me. You need to bear in mind that the current outcasts of Israel, that's you and I. We've been in bondage far longer than Abraham's children, far longer than 430 years. Am I right? Cursed, if you will, for 2,000 plus years, just like Israel in Egypt. But I want you to look at that word, Picard, pay kuf dalet, because it is a code phrase. It's a secret phrase. The letter pay represents the mouth as the source of an oracle, a divine word. If you want to get a word of life, you come to the source of that word of life. If you look at the Hebrew letter pay, inside that letter pay is the Hebrew letter bait. You can't have a word of life without it has something to do with the house or the bride. Are you, are you seeing that? And so this oracle would be very specific to the bride or to the house. And then you have the Hebrew letter kuf. That Hebrew letter kuf in the word pakad indicates the one who's coming at the end, while the letter dalet represents the door. So this pakad yifkad, or secret code, is going to come out of the mouth of the agent who's written. Didn't I just tell y'all earlier that I felt like the house of Joseph is going to be the agent representing yod heh vav -Hey when yod heh vav -Hey arrives on the scene? And so this pakad yifkad has to come out of your mouth, just like it came out of Moshe's mouth, so that they, the rest of the world would know, oh, wow, they got the secret code. They're code breakers. Okay? It's going to come out of the mouth of the agent who's representing the deliverer at the time of the end. At the time of what end? At the time of the end where the curse and the bondage that your generations have been under has been broken because you need a specific word to open the door for the bride of the house. And I believe that specific code phrase is, Oh, Joseph Kai, Joseph is alive. <laughs> now, I want, you to, I want you to look at this word Picard because it's, listen, it is, even though the translators like to make you think that it's punish. I'm going to punish, I'm going to visit the iniquity, I'm going to punish the iniquity. It's actually more often rendered as to attend to something, to number, to appoint, to look after, to care for, to bless. And so in that text that I just read to you earlier in Exodus 34, where Yahweh says, I'm going to visit Pekah, the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, it's actually speaking of the natural consequence of previous wrong actions, and if you stay in a situation where you're following the same actions you haven't gotten out of it, then just naturally you're going to receive the same consequences. Does that make sense? If you've been doing the same thing and never change, you're going to get the same thing. Okay? If you go back and look at the individual letters of Picard, it reminds us that the original curse has been broken. 
We no longer, listen to me, you're free. You have been set free. You have no reason for the curse to still be on you or your children or your children's children. It has been broken in Messiah, and we should choose to come out of her. Why? Because if you stay in Egypt or Babylon, it will continue to subject you to the consequence of generational sin. If I say I'm a believer and that I've been set free from the from the a spiritual perspective, and I stay in Egypt, stay in that bondage, stay in that dead contract, I am going to suffer the consequences of sin. I'm going to suffer the consequences of being in contract with Pharaoh. Are you listening to me? On the other hand, your exit results in a great deliverance where former slaves have a door open to them where they are now appointed to a new status. They're cared for, blessed, and able to access their inheritance. Now, no matter how spiritual you are, if you choose to remain in Egypt or Babylon, you are willingly participating or at least acquiescing, whether it's out of ignorance or not, in generational sin. And your choice to remain there denies the validity of who yod Hey vav Hey is. What you're literally saying is, I'm going to stay here because he's not capable of delivering me. Judah, in my opinion, is doing the same thing now that they did 2,000 years ago. And they're joined by multitudes, literally billions of people around the world that are Christian and Hebrew roots that are denying the power of his appearing to resurrect or delivering them. They Yeshua arrives on the scene and this untoward, unproductive fig tree generation because they were denying the, his appearance to, sit, to deliver them and set them free. They chose to remain there. And listen, we have been in that same thing for 2,000 years. Come out of her, my people. <laughs> Moshe and the children of Israel and prophetic obedience. This was at the utterance of Joseph. You need to remember this because Joseph is a shadow picture of Messiah. Am I correct? And so you can say that Yeshua is also telling us this. Even though we knew that Yeshua himself comes up out of the grave. And so none of his bones or DNA remains in the grave, right? The children of Israel took the bones of Joseph out of Egypt. They didn't take the bones of Zaphnath Paneach. The bones of Joseph was the symbol of resurrection because there was life in the bones of Joseph. Zophnach Paneah died. There was no symbol of life in the bones of Zophnach Paneah. In fact, Zophnach Paneah was placed in a sarcophagus. He was in an Egyptian tomb, a whited sepulcher that was still today filled with dead men's bones. And that's why Yeshua uses the same derogatory words to describe this, those Pharisees and scribes, hypocrites. You are like whited sepulchers. I'm convinced that the third temple will be the same because there will be the bones of Zophnach Paneach will be there, not Joseph. Let's look a little bit further. As we've, at least in my opinion, you may disagree, as I've examined this particular Parsha, I believe we've proven who the agent representing Yahweh will be in the coming greater Exodus. I submit to you, Miss Jean, that it can't be anybody other than yourself. But on the other hand, Psalm 81.5 gives us an additional clue that Joseph, yourself, and Yahweh are inseparably linked together. Find Joseph, you'll find Yahweh. Okay? And there's a lot of arguing about who the identity of this yod Hey vav Hey is. But the facts are clear. I, choose, I, I challenge you to deny this. From Genesis 2 forward, he, the manifest form, the manifest, the, the rabbis call him the Mimra, the manifest presence. From Genesis 2 forward, he's seen in a physical form. And looking at these Torah portions, he ate with Abraham. Among, he was handled, he was touched among other notable, he walked on the ground among other notable physical activities. And if you go back and look in our in 
chapter, uh, paragraph 3 and 4 earlier, you look at the distinction between the names El Shaddai and Yahweh. It is the El Shaddai that tells you, I have the ability, but I'm not going to be do doing anything until you call on me. Call on me, Jeremiah 33, 3, and I will answer. You want to know, how many of you want to know what yod heh vav -Hey's phone number is? Jeremiah 33, 3. Yahweh is, without doubt, the one who has manifested himself physically as deliverer of Israel all across history. And it's also worth mentioning, and you can go and check this out for yourself, that the, there are rabbinic and apocryphal works in literature that regard this manifest presence as the personified agent of Elohim. Now, I'm talking about a different entity than yod heh vav -Hey, Elohim. Okay? Elohim is first seen in Genesis chapter 1. When you look at how he's referred to in the Targums, they refer to this agent of Elohim, this manifest presence, as the word of the Lord. Go figure that one. It is that same concept that the Apostle John demonstrates in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word, wa the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Apostle John's telling you who this manifest presence is. He was the Word of Elohim. Now, here's where it gets tricky because there's a lot of anti-Semitic bias. And you see that amongst Christian theologians. And then on the opposite spectrum, you see a deliberate anti-Yeshua prejudice among a lot of rabbinic scholars. And both of those two entities come together in one place to agree that we need to massage the ancient text to hide the truth so that you can't be set free. Hmm. Is it possible that this manifest presence is the one that Pharaoh was talking about because you will be second only to me. You'll be over my entire house and at your word. See, that he was, he was telling us Zafnach Paneach would be the word of Elohim because that's who he was considered, the great creator. In addition to this, I found no arguments anywhere in the New Testament that denies the fact that Yeshua used the I Am titles as a personal reference to Himself. In fact, you can't separate yod Hey vav Hey from I Am. If, if we're going to be consistent, okay, because when He identifies Himself to Moshe, who will I tell Him has sent me? He says, tell Him the I Am, the eh -yeh, eh -yeh, eh I Am that I Am, the I am who I will be. In other words, look, I am right now who I'm going to be in the future. I am right now who I'm coming as. If, you, if you've seen me now, you see me then. Does that make sense? And so because Yeshua had the audacity to use the ego me titles, they killed him. So what is Yeshua saying by using those titles? He uses it specifically in ten, at least 10 different places. And once again, I want to remind you of Psalm 81, verse 5, because the author of Psalms identifies and connects the events of our partial with exactly what I'm telling you. He's connecting Yahweh and Yohes, Yosef. And so it binds Mashiach ben Yosef to the person of yod heh vav -Hey. Boo! Does the light just go off? Well, I'll just wait until you get finished. You've got 11 minutes, okay? Can't wait to get out of here. Remember, Joseph's Egyptian messianic title was Savior of the World, Zafnath Paneah. And so Yeshua, if he indeed is the Messiah, he would of necessity have to fulfill the pattern of Messiah being yourself at his first coming. In fact, Yeshua is the diminutive form of Yahweh with the added Shua giving, listen to this, this is mind staggering. But it's so simple, you think, why haven't we seen this before? Yeshua is usually translated as Yahweh is salvation, right? And it's actually speaking of immediacy. In other words, salvation, I don't need salvation yesterday. Some of you have been waiting around a long time and said it would have been nice to have had it. 
I need salvation now, and I need salvation in the future. Am I right? In some fashion, if we're going to see the prophecy of the promised seed and the manifest presence, they're going to have to vaira appear in, in immediacy, either in the near presence or the, the near future. Am I right? Now, I told you earlier, and you shook your head as if you agreed. You might not have, but you did shake your head. Then it's hard to separate yod heh vav -Heh from the I Am titles, right? And so if Yeshua means Yahweh is salvation, I can set yod heh vav -Heh off to the side and because this is His name, right? His name means Yahweh is salvation. And so if I set yod heh vav -Heh aside, I could just as easily use the name I Am Salvation. You could call, walk around and call Yeshua I Am Salvation. I don't, it didn't sink in. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 11. It's time to shout. 1 Peter 3, 15, Luke 2, 11. Two separate gospel writers refer to Yeshua in what I believe is nothing short of astounding. Thank you, Yehuchanan. But it's actually hidden to most people. I'm going to read these to you. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Savior? The King James English says he's Christ the Lord. Did you hear that? Okay. Two different distinctions are being made. Let's look at the next one. But sanctify the Lord Christ in your hearts. Now, the King James English just compromises this. And be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks you a reason concerning the hope that is in you but with meekness and fear. The King James English makes a distinction between the two entities, Christ and Lord, and yet even the King James Version is acknowledging them, identifying them as one. Am I right? Let me read it to you. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Am I right? But sanctify the Lord Christ. Come on now, help me out. Look in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know that both Lord and Christ. Wait a second. There's those two, diff two different entities again. That both Lord and Christ. Notice this, Tim. Did Elohim make him? Who is the him? He is the one who was made both Lord and Christ by Elohim. Well, who is this him? The one you just crucified, Yeshua. Now, nobody argues that the above is actually referring, at least from a Christian perspective, nobody's arguing that it's not referring to Yeshua. What they miss is that in some of the ancient texts, the Codex Sinaiticus, that there are place markers that are set atop of specific words in the text. In Luke, the markers there translate to Messiah, a Savior that is born, Christ the Lord, those code markers are Messiah Yahweh. It says Messiah Yahweh is born. While the others, including every New Testament author, says the same. Acts 2 verse 36 says both Yahweh, when you look at the code markers and retranslate it the way it's supposed to be, both Yahweh and the Messiah did Elohim make Yeshua the one you crucified. Well, that's, that's good. Glad you shared that with us. We'll move on. Throughout the ancient text, those markers intentionally revealed that Yeshua is truly yod Hey vav Hey. To reject Yeshua is to reject Yahweh, who throughout history was the agent of salvation, redemption, and deliverance. I submit to you that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed. If yod Hey vav Hey was the instrument of deliverance, redemption, and salvation underneath the, the law, the Torah, then He would have to be the same instrument of salvation and deliverance in the days ahead. I submit they are one and the same. You have a choice. You can dismiss the veracity of John 1, 1, Luke 2, 11, Acts 2, 36, 1 Peter 3, 15, or you can embrace it. 
Yeshua, in my opinion, as yod Hey vav Hey, became the personified presence, the manifestation of Elohim in the earth. And in fact, he himself declares that on at least 10 occasions. Listen to this. John 18, 5 through 7, when they come to the garden to kill him. Yeshua, therefore, knowing all things, did you hear that? He knew this. All things that would come upon him, having gone forth, said unto them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Yeshua ben Nazareth. Yeshua qualifies who Yeshua ben Nazareth is. Because he makes the declaration in the text, I am. He is identifying, identifying himself as yod Hey vav Hey eh yeh asher eh yeh If you thought you were looking for Yeshua ben Nazareth, I am. And the staggering thing about it, go back and look at it. The I am is is in bold. The italicized word he was not in the original text. He makes the statement I am. yod he vav he. And then it says, and we kind of spin across this, and Judas, who delivered him up, was standing with them when therefore he said to them, I am. Listen to this. When Yeshua says, I am, it says that they staggered backwards and fell to the ground. Listen to me. He had used his name on several other occasions. His name had been called out on numerous occasions. But when the connection is made here to who he is and what his purpose was in the earth, it staggers this house. Now, we don't have time to get into the significance of the fact that Judas was standing with them above. That's something you ought to go back and look at because it's powerful. It's far more than just a simple act of a single man betraying Yeshua. In fact, go and look at that word Judas. It is a Greek rendering of the Hebrew word Yehuda. Yehuda was standing there rejecting the Messiah. And if Yehuda is rejecting Yeshua, he just identified himself as yod Hey vav Hey, and they rejected. They became the epitomized, unproductive fig tree. They rejected the messianic advent of the Messiah, and therefore they rejected the deliverance that has been put off for them now for 2,000 years. And I'm submitting right now, and you can just you can look at it for yourself, as the next, listen to me, there is a, a, a next Vieira coming. And as it comes closer, Judah is going to be found doing the very same thing. Not all of them, not everybody that calls themselves Jews will, but there are a lot of Edomites that have infiltrated the house just like they are in the Messianic Hebrew roots and Christian community and they have got to be exposed. What I'm saying and everything that I've tried to accomplish here is that your greater exodus is upon you now, and you, listen to me, you can be the agent of change for your family, and you can prepare the way for the coming of Yahweh Yeshua, or you can stay in Babylon. As for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. Amen. I hope that you've enjoyed this teaching. Hope you've enjoyed the teaching. Give Abba a praise. Hallelujah.